Okay. okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, depending on where you are, of course, because um, I could see from the attendee list that we do have people from um, different regions and different areas. So do welcome everyone um, today for our regular webinar um, from the South China Institute. Um, my name is Huan Zhou, um, reader in international management at the School of Finance and Management at SOAS. I'm very delighted that, um, as you can see, that today we will have a very fantastic webinar, um, which will be given by Professor Yashen Huang, who's definitely the expert um, in the area of economy, politi and political economy, and also the China, um, in the China's um, context. Now, before I introduce him, pre him just briefly and the subject, let me remind you that for the webinar, um, you're welcome to raise questions or comments through the Q&A box at the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. Uh, and if you would like to raise the question anonymously, you're welcome to do so. Uh, but if you um, would like to do so, it will be also helpful for us to know certain kinds of background information about who you are, and that will give me a better sense of your question so that Professor Huang will be able to you know, address it accordingly. Um, but your wish will be respected, neither your name or other things will be identified um, and be disclosed at all. So a very quick brief about um, Professor Yashun Huang, because I think I could spend quite a long time um, to, to tell you guys about how um, much research that he has been doing. So currently he's the Apoch Foundation um, Professor of International Management and um, based in and Sloan School of Management in MIT. And he has been involved in lots of research projects over the past decades, but now his research particularly interested in political economy of contemporary China, and also to understand historical, technological, and political developments in China, which exactly the key topic that he's going to talk about in the next one and a half hour. So I'll stop here because I think, you know, the time is precious and we definitely would like Professor Huang to talk about um, his opinion and his insight. And we would like to come back to the Q&A session afterwards. So now the floor is yours, Professor Huang. Here you go. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Huang. Thank you for inviting me to, um, to give this uh, webinar. And the title, as you can see, is The Rise and Fall of uh, Technology in Chinese History. And it is part of a larger project of a book project. Let me say a little bit about uh, the book. Uh, the presentation is going to be based on chapter eight of my book. And the book has a very long name. Uh, it is the rise and the fall of the East. And East here stands for examination, autocracy, stability, and technology, uh, both in Chinese history and in contemporary uh, China. Uh, it is forthcoming from uh, Yale University Press uh, early next, next year. Okay. So, so let me just say a little bit about the outline of the book to situate today's presentation against this broader, uh, broader uh, coverage uh, in the book. Uh, so uh, chapter one is introduce uh, the yeast model, uh, examination, autocracy, stability, and technology. And the first part is about examination. Going back to history, uh, specifically examination is the imperial civil service uh, exam, the rise of meritocracy uh, in China. And then chapter three is about uh, contemporary uh, Chinese uh, Communist Party as a uh, as an organization, and then part two is on autocracy. Uh, uh, chapter four is uh, 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 is about history. Chapter five is about contemporary China. Essentially, my chapters alternate between history and contemporary China, and then stability. Here, I'm mainly talking about political stability. Uh, chapter six is about uh, history. Uh, chapter seven is about contemporary uh, China. And uh, there's one particular aspect of stability that I analyzed, and that has uh, very uh, current um, implication, which has to do with how 
the system uh, transitions from one leader to another. Um, and this is known as a two lock problem in autocracies. It, it, uh, autocracies struggle with leadership uh, as succession transitions. And then uh, part four is, is on technology. And here um, I have two chapters. Chapter eight is about history, uh, the main focus of today's uh, presentation. And chapter nine is about current uh, China, uh, artificial intelligence and um, 5G uh, and, and other areas of, of technology. I would mention a little bit about contemporary period, my focus is on history in today's webinar. And then uh, chapter five is looking forward, uh, debating the, the model. And chapter 10 is mostly about Xi Jinping era. And chapter 11 is about the broader implications of, uh, of, of, um, of China under Xi Jinping. Okay, so we are also doing other projects that are related to my webinar. Uh, and uh, in fact, my book draws from, from this research. Um, I have a paper uh, together with Claire Yang uh, in Journal of Politics on Longevity Mechanism of Chinese Absolutism. And another paper with uh, Claire on Great Divergence. Uh, and there it is about political divergence rather than about economic divergence. And then another paper with Claire Wei Hong and, and uh, Dan Zi Liao on the Great Tang Song Transition. And then a book length project on historic, uh, historical technology. So basically uh, uh, the webinar is, is based on one chapter of my current book, uh, but this separate book, the whole book is devoted to this one question, the Needham question. So my chapter doesn't do full justice to the complexity of this question. We really need to write a whole book uh, on, uh, on the topic. So let me give the outline of the webinar. And what I'm going to do is to uh, first preview the results and the main contributions. Um, and then I'm going to introduce the database, uh, what I call Chinese historical invention uh, data set and measures of Chinese uh, inventiveness. And then present the patterns of historical technology and then get to the explanation. And as I'm going to explain in a little bit more detail uh, uh, in, in, a, in the next, uh, 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 maybe uh, 10 to 15 minutes, there are basically two um, variables that we use to explain the patterns of hi historical technology. One is uh, state capacity, the scale, the ability of the government to support technological development by funding the science, by funding the, uh, the technology. And the other is what I call scope. Uh, essentially, scope means diversity of conditions, um, freedom of inquiry, freedom of explorations, and multiple sources of funding. Rather than just from the government, it could also come from private sector. Essentially, the way that I explain historical technology is that when China got these two conditions right, that's when China achieved a technological success. When they don't get these two conditions right, they don't have the success. Right? So that's the basic argument for this chapter. And, and in fact, uh, that's the basic argument for the entire book. And then uh, toward the end, I'll draw some broader implications and maybe apply these implications from history uh, to uh, China today. So let me go to the first bullet point, a review of uh, results and the main contributions. So it's just, just uh, because often I cannot finish all my, um, all my slides. So I, what I want to do is to make sure that 
I, uh, I talk about the main findings uh, at the very beginning. So at least I finish introducing the main findings and main ideas. If you look at the, the data that we have uh, constructed, uh, there are three uh, eras of uh, Chinese technology. The first era, what I call the peak era, uh, is from the fourth century BCE to sixth century uh, CE. So roughly about 1000 years. And then there was the decline. And so that's the second period. Uh, the, the first decline uh, can be dated to the sixth century to 13th century, roughly about 700 years. And then there was another decline, um, 13th century to uh, 20th century, uh, about uh, 700 years. So if you think about Chinese history in the last two millennium, you can think about it as the first period as uh, technological uh, achievements uh, and the technological success. And then ever uh, after that, uh, it is a period of decline. What, what's important is that this dating of Chinese technology is quite different from, I think is quite different from the, the dating by, um, uh, by many scholars. Um, most scholars believe that Chinese technology began to decline much later, uh, kind of a Ming dynasty, uh, 14th century to 7th, 17th century. Uh, whereas our work uh, shows that the decline happened much, much earlier. So, you know, I'm not going to say that, that, that we are right and they are wrong, uh, but I'm just saying that uh, if, if we believe in our data, uh, our data gave a very, very different, uh, uh, provide a very, very different timing of, of the decline. And that has some substantial implications of how we interpret the decline, which, which is something I'm going to go through uh, in the rest of the uh, presentation. So, uh, so why does it matter to get the timeline right? Um, one reason why it matters is to get the causation right, right? So if you believe that the decline happened in the 15th century, then typically you would argue maybe it is because of their trade uh, closures and voyage bans. A lot of economists have that view um, because China famously closed itself to the rest of the world in the 15th century after 1433, I think. And for almost 400 years, China closed itself. Uh, you couldn't uh, um, launch uh, voyage, uh, uh, ocean, uh, uh, voyages and they burned the ships they even burn the records and um, documents related to the voyage. So if you believe that the decline happened in 15th century, then you say it is because of that action that closed China itself to uh, trade and to technology. If you believe that the decline happened in the 17th century, then you can argue it is because China failed to develop science. And this is a famous view put forward by Joseph Needham uh, in his 1969 book. He basically blamed the Chinese failure to launch industrial revolution on Chinese failure to develop science. So if you look at Europe, Europe began to develop science in the 16th and 17th century but China failed to do that. And then if you believe that the decline happened in the Ming and Qing dynasties, another factor uh, you could, you could, you could uh, come up with is a suppression of commerce. Um, although that view is debated uh, because uh, uh, recently historians have uh, documented um, that uh, Ming dynasty and Qing dynasty didn't suppress 
uh, business and didn't suppress commerce as much as uh, previous uh, 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 scholars believed. Uh, they suppressed overseas commerce. They suppressed foreign trade, but they didn't suppress domestic, uh, domestic trade. There's another view, which is that uh, Tang Dynasty and Song Dynasty mark the peak of Chinese technology. And, and this is a view that uh, I would say that a lot of kind of official historians uh, in China uh, have, right? They tend to believe that a big country, big empire is powerful and militarily, politically, but also technologically. And then they cite Tang and Song as examples of big, powerful empires uh, uh, being very technologically advanced. But if our data are correct, if Chinese technolo technology began to decline in the sixth century, these uh, explanations are problematic. You know, I'm, I'm not saying they are wrong, uh, but they at least do not explain the first wave of decline. They may add to uh, additional uh, uh, decline, but they, they don't cause the initial decline. So we need to locate other variables to explain the initial decline. And I believe that to locate the initial decline, the reason for the initial decline is actually more meaningful than locating kind of these additional factors that added uh, to the decline. Those initial declines, uh, I would argue, are caused mostly by politics and ideology. Economic, uh, I think economics is not as important. Uh, I'm gonna focus on politics and ideology. Economics is kind of a result of the politics and ideology. Um, and rather than a reason for it. Uh, so, so then we need to look at the politics before sixth century, the ideology before sixth century, and politics after sixth century, and ideology after uh, sixth century. But that's kind of the way that I explained the, um, the, the, the decline. Um, so I don't know if, if, if people in the audience are familiar with the work by Joel Mokir, uh, who is an economic historian, at a Northwestern University. My explanation of the rise and the fall of Chinese technology uh, comes closest to Joe Mokir's explanation of Europe. Uh, he, he does write about China, but his most, uh, his main focus is, is on Europe. Um, he, his, his explanation uh, is not a, <laughs> Uh, a very surprising explanation. His explanation is that Europe uh, was able to develop technology because of, um, basically because of democracy and freedom um, and, and because of the scope, uh, because of the diversity, because of the competition. Um, I, I, think, I, think, uh, I think my explanation comes closest to, to that. So let me introduce the kind of the general theoretical framework of my um, of my uh, my work, and uh, and I use two factors to explain the technological development, uh, what I call scale and scope. Um, the basic the basic idea is that technological development depends on getting scale both scale and scope right. Um, so what is a scale? A scale is government support. For example, R&D spending, public sector employment, and the government's uh, ability to coordinate and to implement big projects, right? Think about highway, uh, um, high, uh, high, uh, high speed rail system in China. Right? So that will be an example of the ability of the government to coordinate and implement big projects. But you also need to get a scope right, right? Scope here means risk-taking, freedom of explorations and inquiries, questioning authority, taking individual initiatives, right? 
So here's the tricky thing. Um, you need to get both right. But to some extent, these two things work often against each other, right? Sometimes you can get too much scale and too little scope. Sometimes you can get too much scope and, and little scale, right? The, the, the second situation, for example, is happening in the West now uh, uh, against COVID-19, right? In the United States, um, we cannot get a significant portion of the population to acknowledge uh, signs of wearing masks and um, receiving uh, vaccine, right? So, so there, there's a lot of scope. There's a lot of freedom of opinion, and that's actually very bad for, uh, for economy and for society. Um, so, so you need to get both right. And, and there's a sweet spot where you can get both right uh, conceptually, although it is very hard to say exactly where that sweet spot is. But conceptually, you need to get both. And that's a little bit different from, um, I will say this is different from, say, the Chinese government's point of view. The Chinese uh, government points of view is a scale is the only thing that matters, right? Government support and coordination. And then there's kind of a laissez-faire economics that emphasizes scope. Uh, my view comes in between. You need to get both right. And I use this framework to apply both to history and to contemporary China, right? Uh, I have two chapters, uh, one on history and one on contemporary China. So, so let me talk a little bit about uh, a contemporary uh, period. Um, so scale in the United States, you can argue it is a National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health. Um, you know, in Britain, there are similar, uh, similar agencies, uh, the Manhattan Project, right? In China, Ministry of Science and Technology made in China 2025, right? Scope uh, in the US is academic freedom, open science, autonomy. In China, in the contemporary period, uh, I would argue that collaborations with the West, uh, autonomy of Hong Kong, private entrepreneurship, these are the scope conditions of China, enabling the technological success, right? So then the implication of that way of looking at China today is decoupling with the West undermines Chinese competitiveness, undermines Chinese technological advance, right? Scale is simply not enough. You need both, right? So that's the argument that I laid out in chapter nine. Okay, so let's go back to uh, history and present more details. Um, so the peak era before sixth century is associated with scope conditions, a political fragmentation, and I'm going to present some data, ideological uh, diversity, ideological heterogeneity, but also state capacity. And we have some measure of state capacity. So go back to Mokir's uh, kind of a contestability conditions. The declining eras are associated with political unification, weakening uh, of ideological diversity during the first decline, basically between sixth uh, century and 10th century. And then the complete ideological uh, collapse during the second decline, uh, sort of since uh, 10th century. But interestingly, state capacity remained more or less constant throughout uh, 2000 years of Chinese history, right? So, so if you have two factors, scale and scope, scale didn't really change. A scope changed dramatically. And then you observe change in technological uh, uh, development. Then you say it is because of the change of the, uh, of the scope that led to the technological decline. What are the main contributions? Uh, so if you look at the two pictures on the right side of the screen, the top uh, picture is uh, Zheng He's um, uh, uh, voyage, right? He commanded like hundreds of ships. Uh, the picture below is the ship by Christopher Columbus a much smaller, much smaller fleet, right? China in the Ming Dynasty was much more advanced in 
at least in navigational technology as compared with the West. So there's a theory which says that uh, the way that the world is today, right? First, um, um, uh, British empire and then American empire. The reason why we have this is because the Ming dynasty ended Zheng He's voyages, right? In the 15th century. Um, so this is kind of the counterfactual scenario that historians uh, debate, right? So what if uh, Zheng He's voyages were uh, allowed to continue, then maybe we, we would have a, what is known as a Pax Seneca, right? The dominant, the Chinese empire rather than uh, British uh, empire. The problem with that view is that if the technological decline began in sixth century, rather than in the 15th century, that counterfactual scenario is much less plausible than, uh, than, than, than it is, um, because it's so far away uh, from industrial revolution. So China was nowhere near uh, industrialization if, if Chinese decline began in the sixth century rather than in the 14th century or 15th century. Uh, so the lessons from history are uh, autocracy is uh, uh, absolute autocracy um, without any scope is uh, detrimental to autocracy uh, uh, technology. My chapter nine uses uh, that uh, framework to analyze China today. And there's really no kind of a unique Chinese uh, model. Uh, so to get scale and scope right, uh, that's true in, in the United States, that's true in Europe, uh, as well as true in China historically and contemporary period. So there, I don't really see any evidence on this kind of a unique, uh, different China, uh, China model. So let me get to the, the data from which we draw the analysis. Um, Chinese historical invention uh, data set and the measures of Chinese inventiveness. So this is something that I, I think, you know, especially people in Britain are familiar with uh, because it is um, based on uh, Professor Joseph Needham. Uh, Joseph Needham is a, uh, was a British uh, academic and he is known for compiling 27 volumes of science and civilization in China. And, and I think at Cambridge University, there's a jo Joseph Needham uh, Center. Uh, I'm not sure if the center is still there, uh, but there used to be a center of Joseph Needham. It is an incredibly rich and impressive uh, work by Joseph Needham, his students, and his colleagues, 27 volumes of science and civilization in China. In this 69 book, 1969 book, Joseph Needham asked, why did China fail to develop science? Why did China fail to launch its own industrial revolution despite its lead in technology? Right? Uh, so he provided the materials, he motivated the research, and ever since then, uh, historians and academics have debated this question for a long, long, long period of time. So my effort is, is part of that larger scholarship, try to understand and tackle uh, Needham question. So we use two source materials to construct our database. Uh, one is uh, Joseph Needham's uh, Science and Civilization of China volume. We supplement uh, Joseph Needham's uh, volumes with the volumes by Chinese Academy of Sciences, the history of Chinese science and technology. And this is a, a, a pretty big uh, project with, uh, in collaboration with Professor Wei Hong of Tsinghua University. The challenge here is that the information consists of free form text without any format, right? So, 
uh, I love to tell you we use some uh, automatic technology to do this. No, it was all just manual labor. Uh, so we, 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 we got the money to hire 44 researchers at Tsinghua University, and we manually uh, digitized the information. And then we had uh, over 10 researchers at, at MIT coding, matching, and assigning uh, the inventions to dynasties. So mostly manual work, it took us uh, um, more than six years. It is still ongoing, actually. So let me show you an example of what it looks like. Um, so this is uh, the volume on physics by Joseph Needham uh, in this in this uh, book, uh, he listed uh, the discovery of uh, the, uh, the magnet, and then he dated the magnet to the third and the sixth century. Uh, is it BCE or, uh, okay, it's a third and sixth century. Uh, so then we will write down the discovery of magnet between third and sixth century. And this is, uh, uh, invention of um, transparent, uh, transparent glass beads. And then Joseph Needham dated the, discover, uh, the, the, the invention to Han or Qing dynasty. As you can see, there's a lot of uncertainty you know, between third century and sixth century Han or Qing dynasty. So we, we, we have developed procedures to deal with these um, ambiguities. We follow Joseph Needham's broad definition of inventions. So we, we don't really kind of make distinctions between discovery, technical gadgets, scientific theory, and production method, because we really have no way of uh, making those uh, distinctions. We just call them the inventions. All of them, we call them inventions. And in our work, we use science and technology inventions and innovations uh, interchangeably, right? So innovation scholars will tell you, oh, there's a big difference between science and technology. There's a big difference between inventions and innovations. I, I agree with all of that. It's just that we have no detailed information to really differentiate between a discovery and the application a invention and uh, innovation. So we just, we just, we just don't, don't, don't uh, bother to make those uh, distinctions. And this uh, data set is um, appropriate for comparing different Chinese dynasties and different Chinese historical eras, rather than uh, for comparison between China and Europe, right? So, because definitions are different and, and, and things like that. So it is, it is useful to look at Chinese history, but it is not terribly useful to look at difference between China and Europe. So let me give you our measure. And so after this long uh, introduction, um, you may be disappointed with how primitive and simple our measure is. Our measure is basically given by the dynasty count of inventions divided by the population measured in million persons of that dynasty, right? So for Qing dynasty, uh, we get 2.85. Uh, 2 it just means that there were 2.85 inventions per million people in that dynasty. For Tang Dynasty, it is uh, 17.6. Right? So this is basically uh, what is known as a density measure. Um, and and we, use, um, uh, we use the historical population estimate by Professor Ge Jianxiong. Uh, he's a very famous professor at uh, Fudan University. He has produced the most complete population estimates. But we also use other population estimates to see if using different estimates will produce very different results and they don't produce different results. So that's, uh, that, 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 that is good. So there are 
uh, I'm sure there will be criticisms and, uh, and uh, pushback on the way that we devise this measure. Uh, let me just say that I won't go into the details. Let me just say that uh, I have thought about the complications and the, uh, the measurement the issues. Uh, for example, we gave all the inventions the same uh, weighting, right? We assume that they are all economically the same in terms of their uh, in terms of their uh, their their impact. You may say that's not true, um, uh, and different dynasties have different length, right? Um, and then uh, you may also say that uh, dividing the inventions by population kind of artificially makes larger uh, dynasties look bad, right? Because the population is in the denominator. The inventions are in the numerator. Um, uh, I'll be happy to go into that. Uh, and then uh, you may say, oh, why not just use a simple count of the inventions rather than a ratio? Let me just say that I have thought about all these objections and criticisms. I'll be very happy to answer questions if you have questions about measurement issues. It's just that let me let me get to the to the findings and, and, uh, and then I'll be happy to come back to the measurement issues. Uh, we have political measures. Uh, we use a, um, the good thing about doing Chinese history is that um, there are a lot of written materials. Um, so we use four biographical volumes of almost 10,000 uh, sort of famous historical figures in China. And these four volumes organize these people by disciplines, such as science and technology, literature and religion. And they have this very important um, uh, information, which is whether or not the people that, uh, 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 that, that they record uh, are hired by the government. Uh, so we use that measure as a measure of state capacity, right? And then they also have information about the religious beliefs of some of these people, uh, whether they are Taoists, whether they are Buddhists. Um, they don't really give a specific category of uh, Confucianism. We just assume that everybody else is a Confucianist. Those that they singled out are of different religions, okay? So let me uh, present the pattern now, I mean, after all this uh, introduction, uh, let me make sure that I uh, am on track. Okay, uh, let me try to finish maybe in 15 minutes. I, I do like to have more conversations with the audience. Let me present the patterns, okay? So as I said before, there are three eras of uh, Chinese technology. The first era from the warring states to um, what I call Hansui Interregnum. And, and that's the name I gave. Uh, basically, it's the, it's the period right before Sui Dynasty, right, Sui Dynasty. As you can see, the average uh, inventiveness score, CDI score, is the highest during this, uh, during this period, uh, 24.5. And then there's a decline, right? So this is the second period from Sui to the Song uh, period, about 700 years. The decline, uh, it declined to 9.4, right? And then there's another decline, right? Um, to 5.3, right? So the three technology period, period one, period two, period three, right? As I said before, a lot of scholars believe that the decline happened around here or around here, right? Whereas my dating is much, much earlier in the sixth century, the Sui dynasty, sixth century, right? So this is just another uh, representation of, of, the, of the graph, right? The first period, the second period, the third period. So 
let me uh, explain the pattern, right? I presented the pattern. Let me explain the pattern. The first uh, explanation has to do with the scale, right? So again, remember my argument is that you need to get both scale and, and scope right. So let me, uh, let's look at some of the scale uh, conditions, right? To get the scale right, uh, it is very really interesting actually, if you go and read the literature, um, much of the literature about the Needham question is about the Chinese decline. Uh, it's actually uh, not about why China initially was so advanced. And then much of the literature, especially produced by economists, is very negative on the role of the state. Right? So this is a, a very famous uh, uh, economic historian, David Lantis. Uh, he's very categorical. It is the state that kills technological progress in China. Joseph Needham, oh, sorry, I uh, spelled his name wrong. Joseph Needham was also very negative. Uh, he said uh, uh, something like um, there is a Parkinson's law. Uh, Chinese uh, official science is following Parkinson's law. Parkinson's law says that you kind of create work to do even though the work is not productive. So he, <laughs> he's basically saying all the government work in science and technology is, 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 is no good. Um, very negative on the role of the government. I disagree. Um, and, 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 and so, so, so the view is that Chinese was ahead because Chinese were um, very smart, were very uh, uh, ingenious. Um, that kind of explanation uh, uh, until the government stopped it, right? So, so that's kind of the, the explanation. Uh, it is, it is uh, you know, I have to say it's a kind of an uncomfortable explanation because it's, it's sort of about, um, about um, the intrinsic nature of, of the people rather than the environmental conditions. And, you know, I, I, the, 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 I'm not saying that these scholars meant it uh, that way, uh, but if you look at how, um, uh, some people have explained Western science and technology. They explain it on, on the basis of kind of Western superiority, Western ingenious, uh, ingenious, uh, ingenious, right? So it's kind of a similar to that uh, rather than looking at the environmental conditions. I have an environmental view, which is the role of the state. Uh, so it's not because Chinese were more ingenious. It is because the role of the state was advantageous to uh, development of technology. And specifically, I singled out this role of the state, the payroll of the state. What do I mean by payroll of the, of the state? Government hired and employed a lot of intellectuals, government employment, massive government employment, right? So if you think about this, in the ancient times, when you had struggle for daily, uh, uh, daily life, right? So basically subs sub subsistence living, subsistence living is defined as roughly 2000 calories a day, right? And we often exceed that now, but in the ancient times, if you are lucky, you got 2000 calories a day. Government employment basically frees you from the daily struggle with substance, uh, subsistence, right? So that means you are free to pursue other things that don't have an immediate payoff, right? Just think about being in that situation. This is extremely uh, uh, advantageous to people who are, um, uh, who are creative and, and, and who, who have ideas, right? Because they, they can use the time and energy to think of ideas, uh, to think of technology and to write poetry, to write essays, rather than uh, using their energy and time 
to get the uh, rice and grain, right? So that's the idea. It's a simple idea, but that's the idea why state capacity during the ancient times was actually very important for technology. And what is also interesting is that the government acquisition of talents uh, were across the board. A um, lot of the humanists were employed by the government as well, not just technologists, but humanists as well. So let me show you some data. Uh, the red line represents the uh, proportion of humanists uh, on the government payroll. The blue line represents proportion of technologists on government payroll. Right? And this is Chinese history, right? 2000 years of Chinese history. It is consistently at a very high level. Humanists, you know, above 80%. Uh, technologists, you know, sometimes it's high, sometimes it's low, but almost always above uh, 50%. A little bit lower toward the end of the Chinese uh, uh, dynastic uh, history. Um, uh, but before that, you know, easily over uh, 60%. So let me talk about the scope. The main part of the chapter is on the scope. Um, the scope, uh, one is measured by the political scope. It is basically political, uh, um, lack of political unification, political disintegration. What is very interesting there is that there's a very interesting uh, divergence between China and the Europe. And, almost happened around the same period of time. So China became unified uh, during the Sui Dynasty in 580. Europe became disintegrated in 476 when the Roman Empire collapsed, Western Roman Empire collapsed, right? Before that, Europe was actually united before 580, for a long period of time, for about 360 years, China was actually uh, disunited. Uh, so, uh, so what's interesting is that kind of Europe and China switched places. In 476, uh, Europe became China before 580. And after 580, China became Europe before 476, right? So the two continents switch places in terms of politics. Um, and as I said before, this is how Joe McKeer and other scholars explain the rise of Europe. And, and there's another scholar, which I'm going to uh, cite later on from Stanford University, Professor Shadell. Their argument basically says, that it is the uh, it is the divided Europe that gave uh, the world technology, democracy, and rule of law, and religious freedom, right? Um, and, and and because of the competition, political competition, economic competition. So so that's kind of the basic idea. And if you look at China. Um, the way that I uh, explain China is that after the sixth century, China got rid of those European conditions. The collapse of the European conditions in China starting in the sixth century, right? The first shock was the political shock, right? Territorial unification. China became one huge empire in the sixth century. And then, the second shock was the ideological shock, right? Became one ideology uh, starting in the 10th century. So sixth century political shock, 10th century ideological shock, and then 14th and 15th century kind of uh, even bigger ideological shock, even bigger ideological uh, collapse. 
of a diversity. The instating cause is the political shock, is this sixth century political shock. So let's look at uh, the political development on the one hand and technological development on the other hand. This is the technological development, the CDI score, right? The highest during the first period. You saw this uh, uh, graph before. So what happened in the second period? The end of the political fragmentation, right? Sui reunited China in 580. What happened in the second shock? Political unification that continued, right? And then there was an absolute dominance of Confucianism at the expense of a Buddhism and Taoism, right? Um, so essentially, the, the, this is kind of the main argument. China got rid of the European conditions on um, politics, on um, ideology, starting in the sixth century. So if that idea is correct, it must mean to say that during this period, there were European conditions, right? Politics was divided, ideology was divided. So this is uh, the next uh, part of the presentation. I'm gonna show you the presence of the European conditions before the sixth century. Oh, okay, before I get to that, let me show you that um, the size of the empire is negatively correlated with the inventive, technological inventiveness. This is the CDI score. The higher the score, the more inventive. This is the size of the empire. And the bubble is scaled to the size of the empire, right? So as you can see, there's a clear negative correlations between the size of the empire and the inventiveness of the dynasty. What's very interesting is that there are actually, if you look at this uh, graph closely, there are kind of two groups of empire, uh, uh, dynasty, Chinese dynasties. There are kind of these empire size of dynasty. These are kind of a really, really big empires. And they are also kind of a kingdom size of the uh, Chinese dynasty. They are not really quite big empires, but they are kingdom size, right? In both categories of Chinese dynasties, you observe this negative relationship, right? The bigger empires, the bigger they are, uh, the less inventive they are. The bigger uh, kingdoms uh, are, the less inventive they are, right? So, but the slope is different. Uh, one is more steep than the other uh, slope. So let's look at the period for 580 and try to understand what happened in China during that period of time. Uh, so this is the period after the Han Dynasty and before the Sui Dynasty. So uh, uh, after 220 and before 580. And so this is a really excellent book by Walter Shadell on, on, uh, on Europe after Roman Empire. Um, the title is Escape from, uh, from Rome. So if, if you sort of use this uh, way of looking at Chinese history, the China during this period between 220 and 580 is similar to Europe after Roman Empire. Uh, so <laughs> I have a phrase in my book, uh, China was Europe before Europe was Europe. Uh, because China, uh, Europe became Europe the way that we know it is uh, after 476. But China before, uh, before Europe was Europe was already Europe. Uh, there was a political fragmentation. There were some 31 governments, concurrent governments, rapidly consecutive governments. There were a lot of uh, ideas, uh, contestation of ideas. There was kind of discussion, democracy, right? And that was the height of abstract thinking in Chinese philosophy. Two of the pure mathematicians uh, in Chinese history lived in this era, uh, Liu Hui and, and Zhu Chongzhi. Intellectuals 
were, you know, obviously they were, many of them were employed by the government, but they had more independence from the government. There was a flourishing of humanities and creativity, right? So this is a European moment in China, the kind of a Renaissance Europe, right? Renaissance Europe had both technology and humanist, uh, humanistic uh, flourishing. Same thing during this period. There was a flourishing of humanities and we have a measure of, of that. And there was a, there was a flourishing of uh, technology, right? As the humanities began to decline, you also see the decline of a technology, right? So basically, so, you know, this is a long way of saying something I, I think many of you probably agree with, which is that political freedom goes with technological freedom and freedom of ideas goes with innovations and, uh, and uh, technological uh, innovativeness, right? So let me skip this, uh, except to say that uh, the second highest um, uh, era is the Warring States era. It has a CDI score of uh, uh, 20, 21.8. That was also very similar to Han Sui period, right? Lot of political competition, lot of ideological competition, kind of European moment uh, in Chinese history. So what happened in 580? There was a political uh, uh, reunification. And much of my book, so this is not in this chapter, but it is in a separate chapter, is about imperial civil service. Um, so it's not just Sui Dynasty unifying China. More importantly, it is about Sui Dynasty having invented imperial service exam, in, imperial civil service exam. It is really that institution that perpetuated the unity of China and the ideological, uh, ideological dominance of Confucianism. So, so it, it is not a military conquest. It is really a ideological conquest and the institutional conquest, right? So the first shock is political uh, reunification. And let's look at the ideological shock. So we have a measure of uh, shares of uh, Confucianist uh, documents of total official documents. Uh, this is not my measure. This is actually by Chinese historians. Uh, this is my measure, percentage shares of Taoist and Buddhist of all notable historical figures, right? Um, both measures show ideological diversity declined and then collapsed during 10th and the 13th century, right? So let's look at the Buddhist measure, right? So this is uh, the, uh, the Sui and Tang dynasty, it reached the peak in Chinese history uh, during this period. So the political, uh, political shock happened first, ideological shock happened second. Uh, and then by Yuan, uh, beginning in the Song Dynasty, uh, the Buddhism began to decline in the Song Dynasty and then it almost kind of totally disappeared uh, afterwards. If you look at Taoism, right? Taoism persisted until the Yuan Dynasty and then it began to decline. Uh, so if you look at sort of the, the last kind of 700 years of Chinese uh, uh, dynastic, uh, uh, dynasties, the last 700 years were a complete dominance of Confucianism. Let me show you another measure, and this is one by Chinese uh, academics, right? Um, and this is the share of uh, Confucian, Confucianist documents uh, of the total uh, official document, right? And as you can see, before the 10th century, the Confucian share of the total documents was only 40%. 
after the 10th century, it rose to 76%, right? So, so this is actually interesting. Um, the, the dominance of Confucianism happened much later than, than some people believe. It happened actually after the 10th century rather than in the Han Dynasty. And, and that has some important implications for how we think about Chinese history, okay? So let me, uh, let me conclude by drawing some broader implications of, uh, from history, right? One is to say that state capacity matters, right? So R&D spending, big data infrastructure in China today, they, they really matter. I mean, I, I'm not taking away from the power of the Chinese government to spend money on R&D, to spend money on infrastructure. But contestability conditions also matter as well, right? And in the contemporary China, those contest, uh, contestability conditions, uh, scope conditions, are manifested in unconventional formats. Hong Kong rule, rule of law is actually one form of uh, contestability condition. Research collaborations with the West is another form of uh, contestability condition, right? A private sector uh, development is another source of uh, uh, contestability condition. The problem is that under the current leadership, the Chinese government is actually undermining these contestability conditions. They pursue state capacity, right? So they are still getting the scale right by emphasizing government, uh, uh, government spending, but they are they are decreasing the scope conditions for Chinese technology, for Chinese economy, right? My prediction is that we are kind of going back a little bit to the sixth century situation where the only thing that's left is the scale and the scope conditions are being weakened and even destroyed to some extent. And so I'm not optimistic in terms of projecting about the future in terms of how Chinese technology and science are going to develop. Okay, so let me finish there and I, I'm very happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for Professor Huang's and talk, which is very, very comprehensive to take. So definitely um, we would like to read about in more detail after webinar. So there are some questions coming out. I'll, I may not actually follow order because I think one question in particular, you know, pinpoint what your broad implications is about, about you know, how your research can be um, throwing certain kinds of perspective in the current picture. Ryan so raised two questions and saying, you know, unlike back then, isn't ironic that Confucianism today might offer very competing ideology versus other Western ideologies, especially when we're looking into the COVID-19, you know, the different way how not just the government, but also the civilian society, how they do it. So is it offering diversity rather than stifling innovation in, from your perspective? And the second question actually pretty much is about, you know, um, in financial markets, how do you reconcile the need for the Chinese market to play an increasingly um, decisive role when it benefits most from freedom of exchange of information and opinion with a very clear political trend that is heading in the opposite way. And then we have seen that, you know, how those kinds of big tech giants really, you know, saw there and have experienced the fast development over the past decade because of the infrastructure, because of the sophistication of the market, right? And, but then here, we also see certain kinds of polls, especially in N Group's case. So what's your thought um, about these two particular aspects? Well, so, uh, so these are good questions um, on, the, on the role of the finance. Um, if you look at Alibaba, if you look at Tencent, um, not so much Huawei, but if you look at uh, Pinduoduo and uh, JD and, and, and these sort of internet players, big players in China and, and DD, right? Uh, they were all initially 
funded by uh, Western, at least foreign uh, venture capital funds. Uh, at that time, either uh, China didn't have its own VC industry or the Chinese VC, uh, uh, VC people didn't recognize their, their value. Um, and Alibaba famously, uh, uh, Jack Ma actually famously went to Shanghai when he started his company. And Shanghai official looked at his business plan and said, what is this? Uh, why do we need something like this? And, and, um, and, and the reason why he located his business in Hangzhou, and he was born there, uh, obviously there's, <clears throat> there's that, but his first location was actually Shanghai rather than Hangzhou and, and Shanghai government didn't see any value. And what, what's very interesting about that is, let's just suppose that, that China didn't have that diversity. Let's just suppose that Hangzhou government was exactly the same as Shanghai government. Would you have witnessed the rise of Alibaba? Probably not, right? So in many ways, so Joe Mokir actually pointed out this difference between China and Europe uh, historically. So if you look at Christopher Columbus, he tried to get funding for his uh, voyage. Uh, he, he, he tried the Portuguese uh, kings, he tried the British uh, ones, and, and eventually he got funded by the Spanish uh, king and Spanish queen. He also got private funding. Had Europe been united with one government, right? Christopher Columbus might not have been funded, right? We actually have this contemporary example of Alibaba taking advantage of the diversity of uh, Chinese um, uh, local political system, maybe not at the national level, but at the local political system. But look at what's happening in China today, right? The national government is, is now imposing centralization. It's decreasing local autonomy, right? And in my book, I actually traced that all the way to 1989. Uh, there was a gradual kind of centralization uh, uh, since 1989, but, but under uh, Xi Jinping, that, that has gone to a, almost a, another level, right? Um, and the, uh, uh, the, um, the, the, the restriction, uh, even though under trade war, China opened up its uh, financial market to foreign uh, investors, but we also know that they are investigating Alibaba they are looking at the, um, the Chinese investment, the Chinese investors who are connected to N Group. So, so they could be a political, uh, political um, implication of what the investigation is going to reveal, right? So I, I, I think that I, I'm not sure if the person who asked that question has that point of view, what I'm trying to say is that historically and in contemporary China, you can actually have the same framework to explain how important it is diversity of funding, diversity of uh, government support is actually important for entrepreneurship, is uh, important for, uh, for, for technology. The first question, I, I didn't quite get the uh, sense of, I mean, I just, wh what do you mean by diversity of vaccination? Um, I'm, I didn't no, quite I get think, it. Yeah, I think the question is about Confucian and Confucian and Confucianism. So because when we're talking about Confucianism today, it might offer, you know, because it's quite different ideology, right, in the West and in the East. And then sure. this might yeah. be quite competing ideology to, to offer diversity rather than stifling innovation. What, oh, yeah. what do you think? Okay, got it, got it, yeah. Okay. Well, I, I, I think the competition is, is good, right? So the competition, um, the, the, my, the logic of my argument is the more competition, the better in terms of ideas. But in China today, is there really competition, right? And, you know, even, even, 
I'm, I'm not even sure there's competition between communism and Confucianism. Um, and let alone competition between communism, Confucianism, and Western liberalism, right? Look at look at the NGOs, look at the the, the, the professors in China who advocated Western uh, Western ideas and compare with 10 years ago, compare with 12 years ago, uh, there was far fewer uh, kind of um, representation of Western ideas in Chinese, um, on Chinese uh, internet, in Chinese official uh, uh, media. And, you know, I, I guess I would advocate Western ideas, but I, I actually don't advocate the dominance of Western ideas. I would actually like to see, you know, both communism and Confucianism side by side with Western ideas. Um, in the concluding chapter of my book, uh, I said that uh, it is kind of stupid for the US government. I'm not sure it happened in Britain. It's kind of stupid for the US government to close down Confucius Institutes in, in America. I mean, what, 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 what's wrong with having Confucius Institutes? Are we so, um, uh, do we lack confidence in our own ideas that we don't want to hear from, from uh, Confucius uh, uh, scholars? Uh, I, I just don't see why we close down Confucius ideas. What I would advocate is for each Confucius Institute established in America, let's have a Western Institute established in China, right? As an exchange, as a condition. Um, and that's only fair, right? So we're not doing anything more than what you're doing in the United States. But I, I just think it's, it's kind of, it doesn't make any sense to close down Confucius Institute. That's a very interesting. I totally agree that diversity and diversity is so important about you know being inclusive, being you know open to the different people and different ideas because that's what in information exchange and knowledge learning coming from. Um, let's go back to some specific questions about you know when you talk about decline um, in this kind of technology and scientific discovery much earlier than the mainstream and historian in. Chinese economy. So there are a couple of questions, particularly looking into those kinds of specific aspects. So Eric talking about, you know, when you refer to a decline in scientific discovery, um, it could be, you know, the phenomenon of diminishing returns rather than a result of a government and the societal changes. So for example, the magnets, um, which was referred in, in Joseph Needham's book, right, can only be discovered once. So it is quite likely that in the future, there might be fewer inventions, all this kind of thing. So inventors in later dynasties will have a few possible inventions to discover. So what's your explanation on, in this regard? Well, but that's not true, right? I mean, the, <laughs> the, the, the worldwide stock of knowledge today is much bigger than the stock of knowledge two centuries ago, three centuries ago, right? If you look at the Western discovery, Western technology, it exploded after 18th century. Um, and, and also, I, I'm not just talking about discovery, I'm also talking about inventions, right? Inventing new things. And there's almost no limit to, uh, to those inventions, um, at least from, from, from the Western data. And it, in, in fact, it, from the Western data, you have this explosion of inventions, exponential growth of knowledge, exponential growth of uh, technologies. It's not just linear growth, it's, it's, it's exponential. The reason is that inventions and discovery of knowledge and uh, technological development reinforce each other. Uh, when you have three pieces of knowledge, it's not like, you just invent the fourth. You may invent the fifth. You may invent the sixth. Uh, you may invent the seventh, right? So the relationship is actually exponential rather than uh, linear. I mean, arguably today, you can argue that maybe we are sort of close to the to the to the frontier and to the to the end of that. And, and there's some research to show, for example, the Moore's law is slowing down. 
right? It's not doubling every 18 months. And also the number of researchers that you need to double the, uh, double the conductivity of the, uh, the, the chip uh, is, is, is much, much more than uh, in the 1970s. So you can argue that today, uh, you may, we may reach some sort of limit. Uh, although <laughs> I, I talked to my MIT colleagues that they were violently disagree with me on, on, on this. Uh, they, they see infinite uh, scenario for science and technology. Not in sixth century. I, I just I, I don't I don't I I I I can't see that as a as an explanation. And also, also it is so sudden, right? Um, rather than kind of gradually coming down, it's it's it dropped like a stone. Um, uh, so that that cannot be explained by that. Mm. I think it's related to what your explanations um, just not given. And there are also some questions particularly talking about because um, in your research, you didn't really specify the different types of the innovation, like, you know, what you mentioned yeah. about invention. Sure, and then, sure. Because there are some concerns that from, from the audience and talking about how do you control the fact, um, especially when we're looking at, you know, not all the inventions can be commercialized, right? Not all the inventions right. will have the big impact. So how these kinds of, you know, the impact related measurement or control and in your research and how and um, you know how, how how we can really use those kinds of data or invention to to be related to the measurement of a country's scientific and the technological progress and capacity so this is a particular question from Ron Hutchings from Oxford University China Center yeah. and quite similarly I put these two questions together because King and C King and I'm not quite sure about your first name but you also mentioned about data and um, there are two particular questions about data is that how um, Professor Huang and your team pick technologies were actually used in production. So again, it's certain kinds of impact okay. and application and um, other than that technology. And um, the second one is how your team measures changes in technological frontier. So I put these two questions together for you to, to respond to. Yeah, so uh, the, these are very good questions. Um, I, I, let, me just, uh, 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 let me just acknowledge that um, we are not measuring applications. And there's a good excuse and there's a bad excuse. Let me give the bad excuse first. The bad excuse is we have no way of doing it. Um, and we don't have GDP data, we don't have economic activity data. Um, and you, you can't really observe uh, the applications of technologies in the production process. Um, and even for modern technologies, it is actually tricky. Uh, it, is actually, uh, it is actually tricky to estimate the economic impact of a particular technology. So if you look at some modern uh, research on this topic, one way is to use the patent citations and, and essentially count the citations of a patent um, and then use that as a measure, especially by commercial citations, right? And, and maybe the royalties paid to the companies, uh, <laughs> we, we have no way of, of doing that. So that, that just, that just uh, um, that, 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 that's, um, uh, if you're not convinced by anything else I say, then I, I just have to default to that uh, ex uh, excuse. The better excuse is we actually don't need to do it. The reason is actually uh, straightforward. The reason why we are discussing this issue at all is because the applications are almost zero, right? Suppose they were applications, then China will be the first country to, to, to launch industrial revolution. What is industrial revolution? Industrial revolution is essentially using technology for economic development, for industrial production, right? The very fact that China didn't have industrial revolution means that almost in all cases, the applications of technologies are zero, are zero. It's a little bit like Soviet Union. Uh, Soviet Union had you know, advanced physics, um, uh, advanced military technologies, 
but the economic applications were, were very little. So their economy didn't actually benefit. In that sense, each application is exactly the same as any other, uh, sorry, sorry, each invention is exactly the same as any other invention in terms of the economic impact because their economic impact is all zero, right? I mean, again, you know, I'm stating the extreme case. Obviously in irrigation, um, some of the Chinese technologies were used to raise the yield, to grow the rice and to grow uh, other pro uh, products. There's no question about it. There, there were applications, but those applications were not big enough to transform the Chinese economy from, uh, from, a, from a primitive uh, economy to a industrialized uh, economy, right? So, so those applications were kind of, in, the, in terms of the historical, um, uh, from a historical perspective, they're actually minor. They're, they're they, they, you know, again, you know, I, I'm not saying there were no applications, but just from a sort of a transformative aspect, those applications are actually not that significant, right? So sort of combine these two aspects uh, together, uh, we, uh, we don't wait uh, the, the inventions and, and our measures. Um, so, so, you know, again, this is, uh, this is not a very satisfactory response, but, but, but I think, but I think uh, that these are the ones that, that that we rely on. Um, yeah, I think definitely all the research we do actually have the limitations of the data, especially when you and your team actually went back to all this kind of historical data. So there are lots of things uncontrollable. Um, following on the data and also, you know, the measurement, there are two other questions regarding, you know, using the population as a denominator, uh, whether yeah. this, you know, um, because this can definitely amplify sure. The effect, sure, let's put this sure. way. Yeah, um, yeah. So, if you can give a quick response to that one, would be helpful. And then to follow on um, also the, the measurement, also talking about whether you spread out um, the duration of each period, because some actually really short lived by yeah, this way, yeah, right? Yeah, like, town yeah. actually special. Sure, sure. So, Matthew Lee actually talked about if we spread out um, the duration of each period, um, what do you see the different yeah, patterns yeah. or the same trends? Yeah. Uh, so let me answer the second one first, uh, taking into account the, um, the duration of the dynasties. So the short answer to that is it, it makes very little difference. Uh, so you can, what you can do is you, um, uh, you, you divide the number of inventions by population and then by the, by the number of years of a dynasty. There are some differences, right? minor differences, but in a, in a sort of a bigger scheme of things, um, the, 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 the differences are very minor. So you still have these sort of three, uh, three eras. The only difference is that the last era, um, uh, uh, in terms of how far the, the decline is, is a little bit more shallow than, 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 the, than, the, uh, uh, than the measure that I, that I show. But fundamentally, you, you, the big patterns are preserved, right? You have the peak era, you have the second decline, you have the, you have, uh, sorry, you have the first decline, you have the second decline. And the timing uh, uh, does not make a, 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 a big difference. So, uh, uh, so I, I think it's entirely uh, legitimate to use both measures. One is just, um, uh, use the uh, population and the other is to use both population and the dynasty uh, duration and the results are not that different. In terms of just using the population as the denominator, whether or not that is unfairly kind of uh, biasing our uh, measure, I think that's an incredibly legitimate point. If you look at the later dynasties, they tend to be the ones with bigger population. Uh, so you could argue that this measure is a little bit unfair toward the later dynasties, uh, such as uh, Qing dynasty, such as Ming dynasty. 
Okay, so let me give two responses. One is that, okay, so then, then you say, okay, let's use uh, just the absolute number of inventions, right? So let's not, let's just don't think about population at all. Let's just use the, the number of inventions. Okay, and actually some scholars have, have, have done that um, and, and, and they, they use that. Okay, let me tell you what the problem is. Um, by using this measure, Qing Dynasty, right, the last dynasty, will be, will be judged as, as the most inventive dynasty uh, in Chinese history, more innovative, more inventive than Tang Dynasty. I think that's, if you sort of, sometimes we say, you know, the smell test, right? So this is smell test. I don't think a single Chinese historian is going to say, is going to agree with that. Um, that, that so clearly there's something wrong, right? So, I mean, and the reason is very obvious. Qing Dynasty had a lot of people and a lot of people, you know, would kind of have more ideas. And if you don't take into account the population size, then you are biasing the measure in a very unscientific way. The question is that whether or not scaling the uh, inventions by population uh, has, has the other bias that I talked about. Well, not necessarily, right? So, uh, so, so, so uh, actually I said, I give two responses. Let me give three responses. One is that if you just look at the absolute measure, it, it will produce a, a very weird picture that nobody would agree with. So, so let's not do that. Then two more responses. Um, one is that uh, this is actually a very standard measure. Um, and especially if you measure something that is, that is more spontaneously coming out of the population. Let me give you an example. The World Bank measures uh, entrepreneurship by different countries by looking at the business creations divided by the population. So, so the population is defined as the working age population from 16 to 68, something like that, right? Maybe 65. That means that each person in that age cohort is capable of starting a business. This is actually very close to the kind of inventiveness we are measuring. Because in the Asian times, it is not like, you know, there's an MIT, you work at MIT, you produce inventions, you produce technology. There's no university, there's, you, you kind of just do it on your own. It is very much like starting a business today, right? The standard measure of entrepreneurship measure is a density measure divided by the size of the population. The, the, the other response is that conceptually, this is actually the right measure. It is, yes, Qing Dynasty has more people. There's no reason why more people means fewer ideas. It's actually the opposite. The, the economic conventional theory is the opposite. The more population, the more people, the more ideas, right? So if you read the economic literature, they, 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 they actually talk about that explicitly. The more people, the more ideas, right? So in fact, the ratio, the ratio should actually increase if you have a larger population as the base. If the number of ideas increase faster than the, uh, than the population, right? But what we see is exactly the opposite, right? which is that larger population produces fewer ideas, fewer inventions. And, and that, uh, that, 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 that's only, that makes sense only if you believe in uh, Malthusian logic, right? Which is wrongly uh, proved to be wrong, right? If, if, if you only believe in, in Malthusian logic, that the, the more people, the more miserable situation is. There's no other scenario to say that more population should result in fewer uh, inventions. It has to be something else that restricts large number of people from being inventive.
right? And then we look at what are those conditions that restrict the, um, the inventiveness of the population. And to add on what um, Professor Huang just mentioned, I'll quickly refer, you know, um, Justin um, Lin Yu Fu. So he also looking into this particular yeah. puzzle by looking to the supply and the demand on the equilibrium. So this yeah, might yeah. be some of the interest to, to look into. Because of the time limit, we will just have a one last question. I do apologize because of the time limit. We couldn't answer all the questions from uh, Professor Wong, but you know the question will be responded later by email. So the last question and to you is that um, Hongbo, so Professor Hong, Professor Hongbo actually is also my colleague. And with she's particularly interested in your framework, whether um, your framework considers how the external environment, especially when we're looking to, you know, this kind for the development of the rest of the world and how closely connected um, of those kinds of global world will affect both the scale and the scope within China and especially um, in the stages of technology development of contemporary China. So give your last perspective on this yeah. one and then, yeah. So there was one part uh, I didn't get because my the voice didn't come okay. out. Uh, and so um, she actually would like to ask whether your framework considers how external environment, uh, oh, okay. you know, okay. the development yeah. of the rest of the world, because what we're talking about industry revolution, we're looking to the different places of economic development and yeah. how closely and the different countries and region are connected to each other. Okay. Would this kind of external environment affect both the scale and scope within China? Yeah. Uh, so so uh, let me first say that Justin Lin, I, I read his uh, papers and, and uh, cited him in my, in my book. Um, he and I actually agree on this uh, uh, civil service examination. He, he, he believed that civil service examination was, was um, bad for inventions. The problem though is that he also said that the technology began to decline in the Ming Dynasty. Right. So if you attribute the decline to civil service examination system, then the civil service examination started in sixth century. So there, at least there's that disconnect between, between the, the framework and the, and, the, and the dating of the decline. But on the external world, my chapter on contemporary China is very much about contemporary world, uh, about the external world. So essentially the argument in chapter nine is, yes, China doesn't have uh, freedom of, of speech and free universities and academic freedom, but China is able to access the academic freedom outside of China by establishing academic collaborations, research collaborations. If you look at the top uh, ranked, publications by Chinese scientists. They are almost, in, almost all of them are collaborated with foreign scientists, right? And if you look at top Chinese companies, I already mentioned Alibaba that has a foreign uh, investor. Huawei has um, 130 suppliers to Huawei before, uh, before the US began to restrict um, uh, the U.S. companies from selling to uh, Huawei. Uh, so essentially, uh, 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 Hong Kong was also very important because a lot of these high-tech uh, companies in China registered themselves in Hong Kong and got their capital from Hong Kong. Lenovo, Lenovo got its early round of capital, maybe round B, from Hong Kong rather than from China, right? So all these external conditions are actually very important to Chinese economic development and to Chinese technological development. My worry is the decoupling between China and Europe, between China and the United States is going to reduce these collaborations. I, 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 at least at MIT, you know, probably some people know one of my colleagues was arrested by the US government for, um, I mean, for basically for false charges, but, but that's a separate issue. And Harvard professor Charles Lieber was arrested. So the collaborations are going to decline. And the kind of collaborations that produce scientific uh, discovery, technological advances are going to decline. And that's bad for China, as well as bad for the West as well, because uh, collaborations are very important. 
Then the issue is, you know, we need to think about the politics. We need to think about foreign policy. What kind of politics, what kind of foreign policy should country like China uh, adopt uh, in order to continue with the collaborations with the West, in order to continue autonomy of uh, places like Hong Kong? Taiwan is actually very important. Taiwan is a big producer of uh, semiconductors and to kind of destroy Taiwan, I, I can't think of a good economic argument for doing that, right? So, so I think the question is very good, which is that the external world is actually a critical component in China's rise of, uh, uh, as a technological and economic uh, uh, power. Thank you so much, Professor Huang, for your time and for your response to all these excellent questions um, put forward by our audience. And I hope everyone enjoyed today's webinar because it's very informative. It actually brought us back to the history to look into you know, the historical development in terms of technology, scientific, um, across the Chinese history, but also look into what the broad implications that we could see in contemporary China. Because I think there are lots of stuff to say, right? But I agree, I totally agree with what Professor Huang mentioned about you know, those kinds of external words are so important. It's not just one way. Because we need meaningful conversation, we need collaboration, you know, regardless of ideological thing. Because I, I just feel like you know, the world has changed to some extent, and not always the right direction. Not for the academic collaboration, but also for the collaboration across the countries and the regions. But I'll stop here. Um, like I said, thank you everyone, and especially a big thanks to Professor Huang for your time. And um, we really enjoyed your talk, and we hope that. Like we would like to have you at SOAS in person and we can have a more meaningful conversation and discussion in this very important topic. Um, I'll conclude here today. And thank you again for everyone thank for your you. attendance. Yeah. yeah, bye everyone. Thank you, bye-bye.